This morning's scripture reading is from the book of Matthew, the fifth chapter, verses 1 through 8. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. Let's pray together. And Lord, we thank you for giving us a teaching. Lord, I pray you cleanse our minds, cleanse our hearts, to where we hear you and you only. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we're going through the Beatitudes, and the Beatitudes are good attitudes to be in. So what are the Beatitudes? Say it with me. They're good attitudes to be in. And uh, today we come across the one, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Why is there so much emphasis on the heart in the Bible? The reason is that today we see the mind as the center of our will and our determination. But in Jesus' day, it was the heart. And you can see this as Jesus talks about this in Matthew chapter 15, uh, beginning with verse 18. But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. Not from the mind. They didn't believe it came from the mind. They believed it came from the heart. Uh, and, and this is what defiles. For out of the heart comes evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are things that defile the heart. So they believe things that were from the heart determined what we did. Not our mind, but the heart. Now, the scripture is, blessed are the pure in heart. We like things that are pure. Uh, is there anyone here who likes dirty air? No, we want pure, clean air. Do we like to drink dirty water? No, we want pure, clean water. Do we like food that's been handled by dirty hands, been breathed upon, or sneezed upon? No, we like pure food. Um, we like to have clean clothes. We like to feel clean. We like to have clean houses. Everything, we like to have things clean. We also like the purity of like pure gold, pure silver. We like to have a pure heart. But the problem is, with most of us, we do not have pure hearts. And that is just so frustrating. I mean, really, it is frustrating to not have a pure heart. Uh, in fact, Paul is very clear. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Paul is very clear. He says, um, no one is good. No, not none. Not any. Uh, not one. And, and Paul, not Paul, but John puts it this way in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Uh, we're dirty. Now, I don't say that to condemn, to point fingers, because I'm dirty too. We're all dirty. And that's frustrating because we don't want to be dirty. What leads us to being dirty? It, just as an oversimplification, but, you know, if we're all just following Christ, we wouldn't have the dirt. But the reason we have the dirt is that we prefer to follow the temptations, and we follow the temptations, we prefer the temptations, the things that we are tempted by. Because if we were not, if we were following Christ, we wouldn't be following these temptations. And right now, some of us don't want to give them up. We just don't want to give up our dirt. We want to hold on to it. At the same time, we don't want to have it. So we're kind of mixed up. But Jesus puts it this way in Matthew chapter 6. For where your treasure is, that is your priorities, the things you really don't want to give up, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's it. Now, before any of us go too much further with this, let's... Let's deal with an issue. A lot of us say, yeah, I know I'm dirty, but I'm not like them. 
You ever known people like that? I'm not like those who don't go to church. I'm not like those people who are so immoral. Uh, I'm better than that. I, I know more. I understand more. I'm more of an intellect, or I am more moral, moral person. I do good things. I'm just as good as anybody else. You know what this is called? It's called the worst sin of all. The sin of pride, the sin of comparison, the sin of I'm better than, I'm not like them. And this is what Jesus is getting to with the scribes and Pharisees when he says, Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. And in verse 24 he says, You blind guides, you strain out a net, but you swallow a camel. What's the camel? The camel is the worst sin of all, pride. Look at me, how good I am. Or look at, I'm just as good as anybody else. We hold on to that thing that we don't, we don't think it's for us. We swallow a camel. So how do we get clean? Is there anyone that wants to be clean? Clean heart. How do we get there? Well, it goes back to the scripture. Blessed are the pure in spirit. Pure in heart, I'm sorry. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Look at the word blessed again. Those three uses of the word. First, the Hebrew. Remember, it means bend at the knee. You bow down. What does that mean? That means you give up the fight. You stop fighting saying, I want to hold on to this. If I finally say, I just can't do it anymore. I've got to give up the fight. I've got to give it up. I cannot clean myself. Today, you're wearing clothes. At some point today, it's going to need to be cleaned. Can the clothes clean themselves? No. And neither can we clean our hearts. Only God can clean the hearts. So that means we have to give up the fight to let God clean the heart. Have you ever tried to help someone and they wouldn't let you help them? Well, here God wants to clean our hearts. The only way we can let God help them is by surrendering the fight and say, Lord, I give it up. This is exactly what David's going through in Psalm 51, where he says, For I know my transgressions, my sin ever before me. In other words, we know what the problem is. It's always out there. It just won't go away. I can't get rid of it. I can't shake it off. I can't wash it away. So he says, wash me thoroughly. You see, he's admitting. You have to do it, God. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. I can't do it. Verse 7, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. He admits he can't do it. And then in verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. I can't do it. But then he acknowledges the way he, what he has to do to let God do it is stop the fight. And he says that in verse 17, the sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. He gives up the fight. Part two of this giving up the fight is you confess. I need your help, God. This goes back to that Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 9, where he says, If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins and cleanse us, cleanse us from our unrighteousness. But we have to confess it. And if we don't want to confess it, nothing's going to happen. First thing we have to do for Christ to cleanse us is say, I stop fighting, Lord. I put myself in position for you to do what you need to do to me. The second, it comes from the second word again, from the Latin word, which essentially means anointing. The blessing that we get from God is an anointment from God, whatever that blessing may be. In this case, it's the anointment, the anointing of cleansing. How is it? It's in the form of a gift. What is that gift? It's Jesus. On the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he broke the bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. What is that reference to? The cross. Do you catch that? 2,000 years ago, before we were born, he died on the cross to cleanse us of our sins. He didn't come here today or 2,000 years ago to point the finger. He came to cleanse us. He wants to cleanse us. And it's a gift of blessing. And then he took the cup. Now what's in the cup? The cup 
and that day was wine. Today, we use juice. Many churches still use wine. But he said, this is my blood. Why did he say blood? Well, he shed blood. Remember, the heart was the center of the person's will. What flows in and out of the heart? Blood. In Leviticus, several times God says, you are not to eat the blood of the animal. The blood is the life of the animal. They believed that the blood of a person was the life of the person because it's the life that flows through and from the heart. And so when we receive the blood of Christ, we're receiving the life of Christ that flows through every part of our body. And what does blood do? It cleanses of the purities and it takes nourishment, oxygen, that the body needs. So when we receive the body and blood of Christ for what he did years ago, and we receive it today, he's actually cleansing us and strengthening us. That leads us to the third word. The third word is the Greek word for blessing, which means that it's all-encompassing. We don't have to do anything else. We don't have to do anything else to earn it or to receive it. We receive it by faith. And this is where we go to that same scripture. Some of us can quote it. Ephesians chapter 2. Verse, by, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Simply believe it. And this is not your own doing. We don't do it. There's nothing we can add to it. It is a free gift of God, not the result of anything you do in terms of works so that no one may boast. When I was a boy growing up and as a youth, we had the old ritual that had such an emphasis upon how guilty we were and how sinful we were. I can't tell you the number of times I would come to communion and I pray, God, please forgive me. 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 I'd receive communion and I'd get up and walk away and I wondered, did it take? Am I forgiven? Do I need to do something else? Which means I hadn't really received it by faith. I was still looking for something else to do because I don't know about y'all, but I grew up thinking you had to earn what you got. You had to deserve it. You had to be worthy. But we're not. When I was in ninth grade, <laughs> we were receiving communion. I was still praying, God, forgive me. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. And the pastor prayed a dismissal prayer. And I don't remember the exact words, but it was something like, you are forgiven. Receive that forgiveness. Rise, go in peace. And all of a sudden, it finally hit me. I really am forgiven. I don't have to do anything else. I've been forgiven. Just receive it. And I got up and walked back to the sea just like anyone else did. But inside, I was jumping inside. I really am forgiven. I'm forgiven. I am cleansed. The thing about it is, I did sin again. But I come back to communion. I receive the forgiveness. So we give up the fight, receive the gift that Jesus already wants to give us, and we receive it by faith. That's creating the purity. Now, last night as I was getting ready this morning, it occurred to me, here's something I've not done with you. I've done it with all the other churches. I've done it with all the youth groups, the children's groups, the men's groups, the women's groups, the retreats, revivals. I've done it in all kinds of places. I haven't done it with you all. There are many ways you can pray. One is by simply closing your eyes, either silently or verbally, out loud, pray to God. Second way is you can write your prayers out. That helps you to stay focused on what you're praying about. Third way is to sing your prayer to God. By singing your prayers, you're singing and expressing things that you cannot express with words. This is a fourth way. And, and if you will try this, I promise you'll have a good experience. If you will, just close your eyes. There's not going to be anything embarrassing at all with this. Just close your eyes. And like we have done so many times, the back of your eyelids see an image of Jesus walking towards you. Not with a finger saying, look how dirty you are, but with expression of, oh, will you let me clean you of your sins? He wants to cleanse us. 
But he doesn't do anything until we are ready. If you really want to be cleansed of your sin, on the back of your screen, look at you kneeling before Jesus, saying, I give up the fight. I confess my sin to you. And confess it silently now to him. And Jesus says, thank you. Now, the second part is he's going to touch us three times. The first touch is he touches us. Imagine at the foot, at your feet, there's a plug like a drain he's going to unplug. And just imagine all that dirty water in your body just flowing and you feel it flowing out. All the sins, every sin, every attitude, every negative thought, every memory, every shame, all guilt. And you just feel it emptying out of your body from the top of your head, through your waist, through your hips, your knees. And now that the water is out, there's some residue still there, residues of doubts. Did this really happen? Have you really cleansed me, Lord? And like in a bathtub, there's residue there, and so it has to be rinsed. And so Jesus touches a second time, and as he does, he just, if you will receive it, he will rinse, starting with your head. Rinse all the junk out. Rinse everything out of your heart that's left there. All memories, all doubts. Everything. Let him wash it all away. And now Jesus touches a third time. This time as he touches, he fills up with the living water. The living water of his presence, the living water of his Holy Spirit, the anointing of his spirit. He fills us with fresh water that's clean and pure of nothing but the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, I, I pray this for everyone. I pray that at least just for this moment, we have pure hearts and clean hearts. So I pray in Christ's name, amen. Now I can guarantee you three things are going to happen. First thing, several of you will tell me for the first time in my life I feel clean. It happens every time. Some of you finally have received cleansing. Second thing, you know you're going to get dirty again. That's okay. We are. Have any of you gone without a bath this past week? I really don't want you to raise your hand if you did, okay? We take baths daily. Why? Because we need regular cleansing. This is a prayer you can pray daily. This morning, I prayed it three times already between worship because things fell apart two or three times and I had to be cleansed so I could carry on. You can do this after you've had a spat. You can do this after a disagreement. You can do this after anything. To be cleansed again. And then the third thing that will happen, because you do this more often, you become more able to see Christ before something happens. Because your heart is cleaner. It's not a once a year thing. It's a daily thing. Maybe an hourly thing. But I want to guarantee you this. It's not the prayer experience that does it. It's your willingness to give it to Christ and let Christ cleanse you. That's what does it. You receive Christ's cleansing by faith. 
not through any ritual, not through any technique, but you're receiving the forgiveness, cleansing Christ by faith. And I pray this for every one of you. Blessed are the pure in heart. Then we shall see God.